to reach to a point where you are not satisfied with why a particular thing is behaving or functioning in such a way. If you pick one idea and follow that consistently, it will give us results. But if we put those hundred ideas and we are in the situation like let's let's follow. Welcome to the Prigya Arora show where we discuss law, entrepreneurship and innovation with people who have been there and done that. My name is Prigya Arora, founder of PA Legal and today we have Dr. Himang Shah with us. He is an advisor in the field of innovation and strategy. He has incubated many startups in India and we are here to learn from him. Welcome Dr. Himang on the show. Hey, thanks, Pigya. Thank you for uh, having me over. And I love the the quote at, you know, on your wall, which is your innovation is worth it. So I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Great. So uh, Dr. Imang, we'll start with your life and your life story. Like how did you become the person today and how did you enter into the field of innovation? Uh, Pigya, that's a pretty, I guess, I don't want to bore you with with a long chronological answer. Uh, I think the short answer is I stumbled my way into it. Uh, I wish I can say mm-hmm. that I had planned everything, but more than anything, I followed uh, a certain curiosity to know how does uh, how does this work? How do you know how do certain products work? How can we make it better? And that line of thinking led me to reading a bit more about how innovation works. Yeah. How people innovate. How you know what are the different techniques which apply to it. Uh, and even more so at the personal level, that how can I contribute, you know, to whatever I was working on. So along the years, I I found myself in R and D roles. Uh, I found myself in bridge roles, which combine things at different disciplines. So it's been fun to to sort of explore, like you know, just some tunnel vision. That okay, how can I make this better? And all this curiosity, which led me to the side reading, somehow you know, tend to tended to help me at the yeah. time when I needed it. So that's how uh, I landed where I am. <laughs> that's so good. So it's like, you know, uh, our, our traits end up into whatever we want to do in life. For example, if you're curious about knowing stuff, how stuff works, you, you can enter into this field. Like that curiosity is something which is very, very important. I think it's fundamental. And, yeah. and not just to work in the innovation space as such, but I think in everything that we are doing these days, if, in, if you have curiosity, that's going to be your X factor. Okay. So if you have it, you know, don't feel bad about it. Don't feel bad when you're stuck. You know, if answers don't satisfy you or yeah. if you're not able to solve something fully, you know, as long as you're curious, uh, you know, it's your, you're going to innovate. If not mm-hmm. today, just keep at it. Tomorrow you Got it. So Dr. Himang, uh, you know, many people think that innovation is something which is very, very difficult to do. It's it's a field uh, which is out of our reach. Maybe young engineers also, they think patents are very big thing, like some something big has done. But uh, on the ground level, because you have uh, so much experience in this field, you also know that, that it is not a very big deal. If you follow the process, a journey, what you also call it as the innovation journey, or we call it as an innovation journey. If you follow a process, eventually something good is going to happen. So can you uh, briefly tell us about the innovation journey or which young entrepreneurs and engineers can follow? Yeah, Prigya, your question is hitting many notes, right? Uh, the, the first one is anyone who is new to the area, you okay. know, whether you are a fresh college graduate or you could be someone with experience uh, you know landing yourself in an unknown area yeah okay. the fundamental thing again I, i'll get back to is you have you are going to be curious because the minute you try to learn something which is new mm-hmm. you're going to be naturally asking questions that hey what is happening here why does it work this way why haven't they looked at things that way so you're you, you learn by asking all these questions even when someone is say, going through an induction program where they're telling you that, hey, here's how a certain process works or here's how a product works. At the back of your head, as you try to understand it, you're going to be coming up with these questions. So 
the start of this innovation journey is going to be those fundamental questions yeah and if you just accept the uh, if you take something for granted without understanding it that's when you are cutting your journey short okay. and that's what leads to people not innovating and giving up because they're like they have run out of ideas so i don't think you've run out of ideas you you've run out of questions kare so so i think follow that question and keep answering that and at at some point of time you will reach a question which is which has not been solved yet or you'll come up with an observation that if you take for example a product and holding this uh, cup in my hand and you know it has warm water and i know that in 5 minutes from now this water you know will be lukewarm or or at best at room temperature yeah. and i could ask a question that hey what is it that i could do to let's say make sure that this you know holds that heat for a much longer time it could be a question like that right so as you keep asking all these questions the what's fundamental fundamental to the innovation journey is is reaching a point where you're like hey, here's a question worth or here's a problem worth solving correct and that's a key pain point which no one has addressed before or if people have uh, let's say solved it that solution doesn't you know meet our expectations there's still a lot more to be done yeah and from that point onwards you start unfolding the other aspects which is ideation and prototyping and then iterate correct so what's fundamental to the journey again is this problem worth solving correct so i i think very beautifully explained this and uh, you Uh, like i i also speak to a lot of uh, young entrepreneurs and some people would say we do, we don't get ideas how do people do that so i i always tell them because that is the small pro- practice which i did so when i started on my journey i used to think oh i don't get ideas i don't know how people get ideas but then when i started writing those ideas i was like oh my god people really you have so many ideas so sometimes uh, because our brain is trained in a way to generate ideas but not in a way to store ideas those ideas just slip off very well said priya uh, that happens right because you you've gone into so many situations where like you thought of this thing yeah. and i went back on it and then you saw either some publication which came out on what you were thinking about or some product and so on and the i guess the main difference between let's say me in that state versus that person who launched that product is the other person took action on it and uh, i didn't yeah and i didn't take action on it uh, quite likely because it was lost somewhere you know in my mind and i i didn't keep a record of it. yeah and so so yeah we don't keep uh, better records of of what we are thinking about so i think that's which one thing which we all need to get better at and again over that periodically looking at the list so just uh, everyone works differently like yeah. so my mind uh, works in such a way that if i have noted it down i may not necessarily need to look it up Good. but if i pick it up let's say every week or so mm-hmm. then it's like you know you're fine tuning like okay ha huh, let me think about this thing i i left it midway correct like we may not solve things fully we have so many things going on in our lives these days mm-hmm. that thing so i think yeah to not just noting you know what what ideas come to your head but also periodically reviewing those that are there any loose ends which i need to tie up yeah. and i'm like hey okay i thought of it let's discard it it's not worth it you know i think even that process is helpful yeah absolutely because we need to act on it eventually so dr mang you just uh, uh, you also mentioned about you know once we have some kind of raw idea we have the processes like ideation prototyping then iterating on to them so what do you think is the most important aspect of this journey and where where the innovator should focus on like the main element where they should focus on uh but i just noticed please call me himam you know <laughs> uh mentioned earlier uh so uh, i think the innovation journey was uh really really important is starting off with uh, an observation so the process which i like to follow is called design thinking yeah uh, it has five stages uh, and the model which i follow has come from the stanford b school so okay. that model i feel is is quite uh, intuitive to understand and the first stage over there is to they call it empathy but it really means of collecting a whole lot of observations 
uh, for the person you're solving for. Mm-hmm. And that person, uh, that customer could be anyone. Yeah, it could be, let's say, a product which you're bringing out in the market. It could be the, the average person like who's going to buy the product. Mm-hmm. Or it could be, let's say, your next team. If you're mm-hmm. working, let's say, a company or if you're working for clients, it could be the person who's going to be inheriting the product after you're done working on it. So mm-hmm. the first thing is, is always understanding what are my customers, you know, facing in terms of problems. What are their pain points that they are facing? What uh, problems are they expressing verbally? And there are times when we are frustrated by something, but we don't know it yet. So we don't express it. So so we are craving for what is called as a latent need. Yeah. So in your observations and all that, the core thing is to figure out, okay, what are... Uh, these key pain points which are not being expressed and if there's something that can be done and that leads you to defining the core problem to be solved mm. okay so so if you don't spend enough time on this thing everything else that you follow yeah. uh, i believe that will be like shallow thinking in some sense right because you picked on the lowest hanging fruit mm. and you ran with it but there may be other alternatives or it may not solve the the customer's requirements completely. Okay. okay. So once you identify that latent need and you define that problem, then you run into uh, what is called as ideation. And ideation is the part where everyone loves to start. Everyone loves to have brainstorming sessions, whiteboarding, throwing mm-hmm. ideas, left, right, yeah. center. Because it gets everyone involved, right? We love yeah. it. So that's the easy part. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what's difficult after that is figuring out which of these you know, you've generated a forest, uh, you know, of ideas, right? Which is a bunch of trees. And that to navigate through that forest, you need to pick one or two paths at the most. Okay. So you you have to identify those and say, okay, I'm going to take this path and make a prototype out of that. Yeah. And as I start making it, I learn whether my assumptions were correct or not. Because ideation, if I use the, the Hindi word, it's khayali pulap, right? It's, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Everyone's just throwing things, whether it's realistic, not realistic. But once you start putting things together, you know, your assumptions come to life. Correct. I am looking at my whiteboard and getting <laughs> scared because you just said all khayali pulao are there on my whiteboard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, but uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll find that, right? That if you take a few of those ideas and, and if you start putting it in practice, you're like, oh, okay, I, I assumed a few things, you know, it's not realistic. Uh, in some sense today or it may not be as impactful as it looks on my whiteboard. Yeah. But that's why that prototyping exercise is so helpful. Yeah. Because at, even at that stage, uh, it's, it should be done in such a way that you fail fast and you fail without putting in too much of, of time or money. Yes. Then after that, if, it, uh, if, if you're satisfied with that, then you go into testing, which is you take you know, let's say a small subset of who your core users are and say that, hey, I've done this thing. What do you think of it? Can you give me feedback? And that feedback could be that just grab this thing, not worth it. Then you should be okay to go going back to the drawing board. Yeah. And if the feedback is like, hey, this is great. Uh, you know, can you uh, do a few more changes here and there? So that will lead you to some iterations. So that's uh, the, the broad, uh, you know, I guess, path or template which I feel, see, it's not uh, unusual, right? It's Correct. I think uh, fundamentally different than what you've heard before. But following that structure has its benefits. Correct. And I also, Himang, I also feel like, uh, like this, as you said, this process is very, very intuitive. It's simple. I'll say it's simple, but it's not easy to follow. Like, uh, like we just mentioned, if we have so many trees on our whiteboards, we know if we pick one idea and follow that consistently, it will give us results. But if we go put those 100 ideas and we are in the situation like, let's let's follow. But we don't have a correct part, path to follow. So these that consistency and that sticking on to one idea and taking one idea at, at a time is also, I think, important. Yeah, agree. And an and element out there, or one interesting way to think about it is, when you're ideating, you know, this whiteboarding exercise and all that, that's when you let go of all filters in your head, right? Mm-hmm. You, you are open to welcoming crazy ideas, unrealistic ones, 
uh, way out their ideas, super expensive ones. It doesn't matter, right? So you are like a kid in a in a toy store. You are having fun. When it comes to filtering and figuring out, uh, you know, what to prototype, I think that's when you put your adult hat on and say, okay, fine. Now I'm an adult, and what makes sense for me to target? Correct. Absolutely. And I think, uh, we, uh, like you mentioned, Stanford, I've also read that book on innovation. And it, say, it says that innovation is the product of invention and monetization. So that idea should should have some monetary value. Then only it's possible to innovate. Otherwise, it will just uh, probably uh, would be of no use to work on. True. So, so I think uh, going back to the start of that journey, which yeah. starts with observations, right? Yeah. And and uh, you you look at let's say your your sets of customers and all that, and then you figure out uh, what is that core problem that they need to solve. And it's very tempting to start solving that problem that one itself. Yeah. And I think it may make sense to insert an an idea or having some understanding that if we solve this problem, you know what is it that we expect to achieve in terms of, uh, of, of let's say, performance improvement. You know, let's say if we solve it, can we, uh, can we do it? And this, this part, you don't need to have a full answer at this stage itself. It could come, let's say, at the prototyping or that later stage also. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you should also have this understanding of, okay, is there revenue from it? Right? Is there an ability to, to create this, this product or it could be a feature addition and determining that Okay, I think it's going to be financially viable for me. Okay. So, so I think yeah, it's it's all. It, it, otherwise, you'll have I mean, things which are way ahead of time. Like yeah. a lot of uh, academic research can tend to be that way, right? Where yeah. because that research is done uh, when it's looking at it's only certain metrics that okay, what is the field lacking in terms of knowledge and so on, the the commercialization aspect or necessarily creating that research work to end products is not important at that point of time. It may be at a, at a certain stage, but you're right. It's, it's helpful to know, I think, that what your end goal is. Like, are you doing research for the sake of research? Are you doing this work yeah. for the sake of, let's say, business? But, you know, it, and having that clarity uh, is also helpful. Absolutely. I think very rightly said that end goal sh should be in mind, then only we should start the journey. Like if you are, if you are making it, we should at least know what, what is the future of what we are spending time, money, resources, and so many things. It's important True. to know that as well. Yeah. So Imang, you are also interested in the field of technology transfer and IP strategy. So how do you club a tech? Uh, first IP strategy, uh, then technology transfer into the innovation journey. <laughs> now again, these are topics very close to my heart. And mm -hmm. thankfully, I get to uh, look at them both from a professional and a personal angle. Although this, what I'll say is, is a completely from a personal perspective. Now, I, I think for both of these, you know, I, I spend a lot of time working with startups. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a startup is usually formed when uh, you know, founders are unhappy with, let's say, our existing products are are meeting that marketplace or, or are performing in the marketplace. Right? So their vision is that uh, we have a certain approach which is going to either 10x or 100x, uh, you know, the user's life. Mm -hmm. So naturally, they they are they start, but their origin is from a view of innovation. Yeah. And out there, it's it's again the, I guess. The environment of that startup is ripe for multiple inventions to occur, mm -hmm. and so having an intellectual property strategy at that point of time is a, a core requirement. It mm -hmm. should not be an afterthought. It should be like a fundamental premise, right? Because as companies are building various things, that hey, this is let's say our tech portfolio that we are building. They have to look at okay, what is an IP portfolio that that we are going to build mm -hmm. now. Intellectual property is going to be the outcome of a lot of their research work that they are doing, a lot of their uh, product development which they'll do, right? So, mm -hmm. so once you once you have that, uh, once you are sitting on technology, I think at that point of time also, looking at this space, it's I can't help but but say that uh, 
you know, a lot of startups change their strategy because they have to pivot depending on what the market is, is telling them. Maybe they see a shift in their strategy. So if they have not, let's say, generated or cap or uh, registered any IP portfolio, mm. all the work that they did mm. is just line based, you know, it's so rather, you know, through tech transfer, mm. they can do so much better. Yeah. That they can, they can earn some return on all the work that they've done. Uh, there's another, another aspect also as companies scale up, uh, you know, every startup is different. You know, not, not every founder wants to grow their company to, let's say, a thousand person or a five thousand person entity. Correct. They may be very happy being small, you know, and just focusing on, on say, product innovation. Correct. So for them, if they don't want to get into the manufacturing space, whether it's in their country or internationally, mm. tech transfer helps in those domains also. Correct. Right? And Absolutely. You can enable others, all the work that you've done, you are helping other people, you know, I guess take advantage of the innovations which you're bringing in. Yeah. So it's it's from both both sides, right? That you have to look at it as, hey, I'm doing all this work and IP strategy is going to be important for me to grow. But it's also going to be helpful for me to look at all these other avenues uh, in which I can uh, monetize or commercialize my innovations. Wow, absolutely amazing. So here, Imang, I'll ask you one question, which is, uh, you know, people, they get very dicey in this situation. Like few, few startups will think, okay, like many of the subject matter, they are not even patentable. So for that subject matters, they'll ask, is it a good idea to get a patent? Because they are like 70% sure they'll not get a patent, but 30% chances are there that they get a patent. Then in, and these are some, some registrable IP. Then we have unregistered IP in terms of know-how, in terms of trade secret and things like that. So while Tech, uh, technology transfer uh, do they have to keep in mind all of this or they they can do a tech transfer only when they have an enforceable patent or a registered patent i think you have to be open to all forms of ip rights right it's yeah. not that there's just one which is going to be you know the most powerful IP right now having said that uh, I, I do work in the high tech space and patents are certainly like the IP that, that we all naturally gravitate towards. Correct. But again, you, you have to look at it as a broad landscape, right? Your your portfolio is not just on one IP, right? It, yeah. it has to be a combination of these and all of those are going to be relevant as they scale up. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that that's a very insightful answer because people get stuck sometimes with one IP and they're like, oh my God, now what to do? We can't do anything. I said, you, you can think like... Uh, a, a small example today, I was chatting with a friend and he was like, okay, I can't file, file a patent on this. Then I suggested, okay, you can't file, uh, file a patent, but you can register it as a, so it was a board game. It was a kind of a board sure. game, which are, uh, which is a subject matter of designs and it is nearly an equal protection as of patent. So after, after speaking to me, they were like, oh, oh we, we never thought to consider yeah. this as well. Yeah, so, so I think this is a problem that we came across and uh, I'll, I'll take this opportunity to plug something mm -hmm. uh, that we've been working with uh, DPIIT and Delhi yeah. uh, Valley. That's when working with startup and particularly founders, this is a this was sort of one of the problems that we would come across. That mm -hmm. the understanding of, of intellectual property would vary like by a great deal. That mm -hmm. the folks would be just completely unaware and of course, then you have some some category of folks who, let's say, have have in their prior work experience, they've known what uh, what IP is and how it works. And in between, also you have you know like your friend, such varying levels of understanding. Correct. So there is a you know there are a lot of resources which they can tap into. Firstly, they can talk to folks like you who are so helpful. You know, leveraging on uh, leveraging your the ability to connect with you on LinkedIn on other social media platforms. Right. Uh, I know in particular the Indian IP community is so friendly and approachable. Yeah. That you know, so many of us are are doing things pro bono just out of love, right? That the awareness needs to increase. Correct. Absolutely. Right? If you if you look at how the IP in the offices are are being proactive, you know, the growth rates of 
whichever metric you take a look at, those are all signs of encouragement. Uh, and and then separately you have uh, you have many uh, IP learning courses. So we, we developed a course dedicated for startups and SMEs. Yes. It's called L2 Pro. And later on, if you like, I'll share the link with you. It's a completely free free course that is meant for startups and SMEs to understand really how IP strategy works and what are the various nuances like you discussed. Yeah. So I think these uh, this uh, ability to to inform themselves. So again, what I'd like to tell most of the founders is that you don't need to, let's say, become a patent agent or you don't need to you know, go through that legal curriculum. That is. But you do need to understand a few things. You know, my analogy is, is I'm decent with finance. I could do my own taxes. But I'd rather leave that work to a chartered account. Really? But I do need to take care of, of, let's say, broadly, okay, what are the various ways in which, let's say, personal finance works? Hmm. So similarly, inform yourself about how intellectual property works. And then turn in, turn towards the experts. We have so many of them. And I'll also suggest, I'll tag the link in the description. Go check out the course because it is so, uh, I have personally checked it out and it is in the language which startups and MSMEs can understand. It is not in the language that only legal professionals understand. So do check it out if you're interested in this field. Yeah, thanks, (laughs) Vigya. So, so Imang, now, uh, would you like to give some advice to people who are aspiring innovators? Anything that you would like to give them? I think I'll repeat that. uh, Keep the curiosity hat on always, right? Always uh, be questioning things, how how things work and so on. Maintain a a question bank like what you were suggesting or an idea bank as such. And don't be afraid right, to get into uncharted waters. Wow. Like as you as you go through them, it's your curiosity which will take you across and you know, opportunities will open up. Wow, amazing. So now we'll do a quick rapid fire round with you. And after that, we'll reiterate these points because these are the points that I believe everybody should take with them. So first we'll do a quick rapid fire round, which are which is like, uh, let's start. What are three things you are grateful for? Uh, family, uh, friends, and uh, education. Great. Two traits that you think are useful for an innovator? Uh, curiosity and persistence. Wow. And one aspiration you have for the future? I want India to you know, continue its path on the innovation regime. Wow, amazing. So now you can mention the key takeaways for our audience. And I I know people would love to take uh, these things away from you. (laughs) Not away, (laughs) like they'll be (laughs) joining you (laughs) on this journey. (laughs) Thanks, Pigya, for for doing this thing. So the key takeaways are going to be curiosity and persistence. Curiosity is the start of your innovation journey. Right. So the questions are why, where, how, what, and why is the most fundamental one. And if you reach to a point where you are not satisfied with why a particular thing is behaving or functioning in such a way, know that a journey is about to unfold. And after that, you have to be persistent at, at getting to that level of understanding, uh, which will again lead you to, okay, what can you do to make it better? Yeah. So like to keep at it again, you know, that's when innovations are are realized. So you look at every innovator, they didn't just have ideas. They yeah. backed up their ideas with action over long periods of time. Wow. So start with why back up your ideas with uh, action and you'll do great. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Himang, for accepting my invitation and for being on the show. It was amazing chatting with you. <laughs> Likewise, Pigya, love what you are doing and keep on inspiring more people. We need more innovators, you know, not just in India, but worldwide. Uh, and your efforts are going to yield remarkable results. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Hey there, thank you for attending today's session. If you enjoyed today's session, do follow our channel and consider sharing it with a friend. My name is Prigya Arora, daughter of inspiring parents, alumna of IIT Kharagpur, engineer turned lawyer and entrepreneur, and now founder of PL Legal, where we help creators and innovators protect their intellectual property. Thank you. Thank you.